Hi, my name is Bernie Williams and welcome to that 4x4 show. This week we're coming to you from the Johannesburg International Motor Show held at Nazrec. I'm assisting with the guys from Toyota and also the Toyota Advanced Driving Academy with some driving on the Toyota stand. We also take a look this week at the Atlantis Dunes route and we also have a little peek at what's happened to our little Daihatsu Terios. And if you've been wondering, Omhanis is working very, very hard. So here we are in the latest FJ Cruiser and they've really uprated this car, added a couple of nifty features. Uh, primary school science teaches you that power takes the path of least resistance and we're on a system here where we've got three rollers and so you've got three wheels that is now receiving all the power so we're not going anywhere. You can spin this vehicle or rev it as much as you want to, there's absolutely nothing happening. And the moment you select low range in this vehicle it also switches off the traction control and the stability control. So now Traditionally, I would have to use the diff lock, which has been moved from the bottom of the center console to the top of the roof here, which is quite awesome. And they've also added a core control, but more about that just now. Now they've added a feature called active traction control. So now I'm activating the traction control system again, not the stability control system, because stability control, when it picks up wheel spin, it will actually take away power. I need all the power. So now I've activated the traction control and I need to rely on the system because I've only got one wheel that's going to offer me traction. Let's see if this works. Ah. So theoretically, yes, if I have traction on one wheel, I should be able to get out of an obstacle. So for the next obstacle, I'm going to be selecting Diff lock, traditional diff lock as we know it because this is a nice little tight axle twister. Find the balance point. In terms of degrees that you can drive safely, 45 degrees we call 100%. Now you can't drive 100% unless you anchor the vehicle. Otherwise you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're either going to flip over backwards or over forwards depending on whether you're going up or down. So the next obstacle we're going to drive up is a nice 43 degrees. Old diesel vehicles, um, I know a lot of the older folk will remember, used to have a hand throttle. You could control the crawling function. Now, they've made it electronic. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I've now set it at its slowest speed and I'm activating it. It is now electronic, so here we go. I can also make it faster. This is our old faithful 1978 Toyota Land Cruiser. And this is still used as a workhorse on the Hendops 4x4 trail. Yes, sir, this cruiser has been working on this farm for almost 40 years now. And at times, it still helps out when a recovery is required on the 4x4 tracks. Unlike my fancy pantsy retro cruiser, this 78 model has absolutely no traction aids. It relies completely on the excellent wheel articulation from its solid axles and the low revving chuck chuck power of the straight six diesel engine.
On a tough 4x4 track, the cruiser's 3.6-litre diesel engine, which delivers 70 kilowatts of power and 216 newton meters of torque at 2,200 RPM, working in unison with the transfer gearbox's low-low ratios, ensure that the old Toyota keeps on climbing and climbing. Sure, it will be able to go further with a rear diff lock, but with an experienced driver behind the wheel, this old cruiser will go very far off the beaten track. It just feels so solid, so unbreakable and so well cruiser-like. It's no wonder the cruiser family basks in its tough reputation. It just feels so together even after decades of hard labor. And now on that nostalgic note, back to the motor show. We've been inundated with inquiries as to what does the Terios finally look like. Well, here it is. Ah, uh, the Terios. Kitted out in a new jacket, the turbocharged little Daihatsu certainly drew a lot of attention. With its snorkel, the custom aluminium front bumper and winch, and the cool wheels and all-terrain tyres, this man-upped Terios certainly looks a bit more boss than its more mundane siblings. Atlantis Dunes in Cape Town is probably the most popular playground for 4x4 enthusiasts in the Cape Town area. Let's go and have a look. It's like a big old sand pit, a really big one, where you can go play with your 4x4 to your heart's content. It's the famous Atlantis Dunes, situated about 40 kilometers from Cape Town. It offers a great mix between a real 4x4 challenge as well as being a great family outing where the kids can go while boss in the big heaps of white sand. However, it's definitely not the kind of place to tackle single-handedly, especially if you are a novice driver. If you've never been on the dunes before, some of those sharp crests can easily catch you out and leave you in tears rather than with a smile on your face. So best go in a small group of a few cars preferably with an experienced sand driver in the lead that can scout the terrain first. Although a 4x4 with a transfer case is not essential, your 4x4 does need to have reasonable ground clearance and preferably tires with higher sidewalls so you can deflate them properly. The guys in the know recommend a pressure of around one bar, especially on hot days when the sand gets extra tricky to negotiate. There is a magnitude of dunes to choose from too from small little heaps to big and hairy climbs that need lots of horsepower and some driving skill. Oh yes, and here are no amenities. So, no toilets, no shops, no nothing. Just lots and lots of sand. A few bookies, the Atlantic Ocean in the distance and that big old mountain the Capetonians brag about so much in the background. You'll need to secure a permit from the Atlantis municipality to gain entry to the dunes. And on weekends, this beautiful place is said to get a little bit cramped with bikes and quads and 4x4s. It still offers a spectacular sand driving experience within a rock's throw from Cape Town. It's really one of those bucket list kind of 4x4 places. The cost is 126 Rand per 4x4 per day, and you need to obtain the permit from the municipality. Unfortunately, permits are not for sale at the entrance gate. For more information, visit our website. So not only do they have the mountain, they also have the sand. I'm really jealous. But now it's time to hit the road and have a look at what's going on here at the Joburg International Motor Show. Join me. And my first port of call happened to be the Arctic truck stand where this little ranger was on display. kind of feeling like an adventurous uh, explorer because I've just discovered the Ford Ranger Arctic truck. Man, what a monster. And there's also an Amarok and a 90 Land Rover. Let's go and have a look at those as well. 
Also on the stand is a Landy 90 that had rolled and was then turned into a very cool Arctic truck machine. He has even a 37-inch Amarok too. Here's another Amarok, but this one has 22-inch low-profile tires and racing bucket seats. Oh yes, and a 200 kilowatt and 600 newton meter V6 turbo diesel engine under the bonnet. It's the Vortisier Amarok, and even though it won't do so well on Umfriki's farm, it looks pretty darn good. And that's the facelifted Toyota Prado, now sporting a new headlight design and other detail upgrades. Other interesting bits include the cross-country Ford Ranger racing bucky, the next generation GWM Steed 6, a cool-looking Hyundai Santa Fe, and a big, slightly impractical but oh-so-cool Mercedes-Benz Unimog concept. Talking about big, this is Isuzu's 37 inch KB, custom built here in the RS of A. It boasts a 230 millimeter lift kit, big mud terrains, fancy lights, and an interesting wrap finish. One of these will just be dandy in Jobbik's traffic. And this is brand new from Len ja um, Tata. It's called a Stormer. The interior is not too bad, but please just tell me what's up with the plastic wood. Come on. This is 2013 already, guys. This is a World War II Jeep replica. Yep, just like that Tata Malandi's fake wood, it's not quite the real McCoy, but it certainly looks the part. This replica is based on the World War II Jeep as originally designed by Bantam and later manufactured by both Willis and Ford. This Jeep is the love child of Andre van der Sant, who really loves Jeeps and 4x4s. He's been working hard on the project for some years and only finished it weeks before the shoot. And just like the original Jeep, it sure is very, well, basic. It's very basic. Big air conditioner, no doors, no windows, and no safety belts. Besides the all natural air conditioning, there are no luxuries in here. No seat belts, no doors, no radio, and no power steering. There are at least some cool dials that Andre's added. Oh, and you get a spare wheel, conveniently mounted on the rear well door. At least the little old Jeep is quite the performer, thanks to the drivetrain. The original Jeep had a 45 kilowatt side valve motor, but this one is even better. It's got a Toyota motor. That's right, it's a Toyota 4Y engine that lives under the Jeep's bonnet. The overhead valve mill has a capacity of 2.2 litres, which is the same as the original Go Devil engine used in the Jeep. It delivers 70 kilowatts of power and 182 newton metres of torque, and it sends its power to the wheels via a four-speed manual gearbox and transfer case from the Toyota parts bin. The four-wheel drive drivetrain is also Toyota, so it's a part-time 4x4 with manually locking front hubs. Some might call it a travesty, this Toyota engine in a Jeepish classic. But considering that a real original Jeep from the war period will set you back around 750,000 Rand versus the 100,000 Rand or so for the replica, then it all makes all the more financial sense. And no matter, it puts a big smile on owner Andre's face, so who cares who says what in any case. This Jeep is not as comfortable and full of tricks like the new one. 
but it's still a lot of fun to drive. Last week, we told you to remember that when you fit accessories to your vehicle, make sure that you have cleared in your mind whether it's fashion or function. This is a very good example of a functional rear tow bar. Let's have a look at our two examples. Both these vehicles are fitted with detachable tow bars or tow hitches. So we are going to remove them both before someone says yes, but you should have removed them first to explain your point. Here we go. We're removing both of them. Tinas, your bucket first. And now it's time to remove the tow hitch from our supplied vehicle. Tinas? The tow bar on the 3 litre D4D is at first a little bit stuck, which is maybe not a bad thing, because at least you know it won't get lost somewhere on your travels. Okay, so in its standard guise, that would be your departure angle, the angle through which you could move through an obstacle. Now we have this accessory fitted, so now look what happens all of a sudden. Now I'm starting to get a problem, because now my departure angle is not what I really need. So you can imagine, going down is not so much a problem. Imagine going up an obstacle, not making it, and having to drive back. And you have this point, which is protruding the furthest, stick into, into the ground at the bottom. Then you've got a huge problem. Unless you have a friend with you that can actually pull you through that situation, you really are going to be stuck. So be careful what accessory you're fitting on the back here. I know we all want tow hitches because you want to tow the bike or the bicycles or the trailer, the little fender when you go on holiday. So when you do fit a tow hitch to your car, make sure that it actually enhances your departure angle and not impedes on your departure angle. Here we have a replacement rear bumper, and this is something that's exceptionally functional. Besides the fact that it doesn't really impair on your departure angle, and in actual fact, probably enhances it because it's sitting a bit higher than it would normally be. Function, you can have a spare wheel carrier fitted to the back. Here we have two jerry cans that uh, fits onto the back. You also have high lift jacking points on this, and you also have the vital recovery points on the back of your vehicle. So remember to ask yourself the question, is it fashion or is it function? And with that in mind, it's time for us to explore some more here at Jim's. Off we go. This is the new Volkswagen Cross Coupe concept car. Two electric engines, one turbo diesel engine and 220 kilometers an hour. It's just a concept at the moment, but this hybrid business is getting more mainstream these days, and this fallout doesn't look half bad either. And this here is the Land Rover stand, featuring a variety of big, small, new, old and expensive machines. One new Landy in particular drew a lot of attention. This is the brand new Range Rover Supercharged Sport. This has got 375 kilowatts and 625 newton meters of torque. And this Bernie is a 1949 Land Rover. Yeah, yeah, Omanis. This is one of the first 80 inch models, and this particular model is a very, very rare 1949 model. From 1950 onwards, the round headlights were mounted in front of the mesh grille but in the 1949 version, those lights were still behind the mesh grill. This Landy has got a reclining seat. It's got an air conditioner like the Jeep, and also a heater with, through the rubbers there at the bottom of the clutch and the brake. That's right, a heater in the floor. Okay, so not really. But on a cold day, the heat from the engine slips through the gaps next to the pedals and does keep the driver's feet just a little bit warm. No matter, this old Landy is still very cool to drive. This old Landy 
and a, has got a 1500 overhead side valve motor with a four speed box and with a transfer case. This classic's original engine is still in service. It produces 37 kilowatts of power and uses a four speed manual gearbox, and it also has a transfer case. This Landy used a clever freewheel unit that disengaged the front axle in the overrun, allowing a kind of permanent four wheel drive arrangement. Not too shabby at all for 1949. This Land Rover also has a few other unique party tricks, like the power takeoff point or PTO at the back that could be used to drive farm implements and machinery. It also had a cool mechanical winch system at the front that is driven straight off the engine after you engage the system. It ain't fancy, but very, very effective. The technological wonders don't end there. On the steering column, you even get a dim and bright switch that can change the candle power on the lights. You have to say that this Landy, as outdated and as basic and as uncomfortable as it might seem now, was a true pioneer in the world of the 4x4 and helped pave the road for Land Rovers in all shapes, sizes and prices. More than 55 years later, you can still see the design of this old lady in the new Land Rover 110s. It just shows you how good the original design was in 1949. No, man. Honest, this is not fair. It doesn't work like this, eh? Well, that's it for this week, folks. Same place, same time next week. But next week, we get to drive a very special vehicle down Sarni Pass. In the meantime, please keep left and pass right. Catch all the latest motoring news in Leisure Wheels magazine. If you want more information about that 4x4 show, find us on Facebook. There you will also find more information about that 4x4 trip in conjunction with Leisure Wheels magazine. That 4x4 show brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion.